My contention is that the world spends its time talking about carbon. And uh, you get carbon on your breakfast cereal nowadays, carbon footprint this, um, and uh, carbon neutrality, but nobody's really talking about nitrogen. And so this is my challenge to try to make nitrogen uh, interesting for you, tell you why you should care about this thing called nitrogen. So I've titled it The Godfather of Environmental Pollution. So think about uh, the movie The Godfather, the guy that's pulling all the strings in the background and you see all the results of his activities but you don't quite see the Godfather. So my contention is that nitrogen is this hidden figure that you might not be thinking about nitrogen but you see it all the time, all the time, all the time, even when you didn't realise. So there we are, Godfather of Environmental Pollution. And uh, let's just start, I'm going to tell you about the different nitrogen forms to get that over and out of the way. And the first thing to realise, the first nitrogen form is N2. Two nitrogen molecules, st nitrogen atoms sticking together with a triple bond. It's really strong, that triple bond. It means it's a very low energy state. Everything wants to get back to N2. 78% of the air we breathe Every breath is nitrogen. What does it do? Nothing much at all. And that's why we need it, because it does nothing much at all. It means that the oxygen isn't too much. So we've got a nice stable atmosphere we can live and work in. But if you put a lot of energy into that, you can start making other forms. And the first of those is ammonia, nitrogen and three hydrogens. Um, you can, that, every time organic matter decomposes, the first small molecule to come out is ammonia. When we make manufactured nitrogen compounds, is ammonia is the first one. Um, then we've got nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide together making NOx, that mix of air pollution you find in cities. So you run your car engine, high temperature, some of the N2 from the atmosphere is oxidized to NOx, comes out as pollution. Next one, nitrates. Um, oxidize it a bit more and you get nitrates, you could then form particulate matter in the atmosphere, ammonium nitrate, particulate matter. Um, or nitrates in water pollution. Um, nitrous oxide, so this one is a greenhouse gas, it's very stable this one, um, it also absorbs radiation from the sun, hence it's a, a radiative forcing effect. So, and I haven't even listed all of the nitrogen compounds, just some of the main small ones uh, which have links to environmental effects. And already you can see, I've mentioned air pollution, water pollution, uh, greenhouse gas balance, you can see why nitrogen is having several impacts. Um, so let's just summarise very briefly why I care about nitrogen. Um, the first, we've got these many forms, many processes. It's the substance of life, I would say, so you don't get any enzymes or any proteins or any amino acids without nitrogen. Or put it another way, uh, carbohydrate, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, uh, add nitrogen, you start making amino acids, proteins, enzymes, DNA, all lots of other things. Um, it's also of policy interest because all of these benefits and threats when we start changing the world's nitrogen cycle. And I would argue that while it's been hidden as the godfather of pollution, actually because we are struggling to make changes, one of the reasons for that is that we fragmented the problem. We look at air pollution on its own, or water pollution on its own. If we start joining them together, it could help us overcome the barriers to change. Um, and press interest, so this godfather idea, but I'll come up with several other ideas where my aim is to try to get you thinking why you should really care about nitrogen. So uh, let's just take a starting point here. I'll say that this is the greatest geoengineering experiment of the 20th century. You talk about geoengineering now after uh, modified climate change. Well, the geoengineering done before was this one reaction. Um, take nitrogen, put it with hydrogen at high temperature and pressure. Uh, they wanted to make ammonia, this guy, Fritz Haber. He got a Nobel Prize for that. Um, he actually also wanted it to make ammunition to win the First World War. He was on the German side, same guy that made um, poison gas for the trenches. Um, but having released all that stuff, we've doubled the supply of nitrogen compounds in the world in the terrestrial environment. So it's a massive geoengineering experiment. We want to make food, uh, but we've released this stuff all over. What's happening? And of course they didn't have any expectation of what might happen. So it was the food fuel for the Green Revolution. All those fertilizers produced from this ammonia helped us grow the crops in the Green Revolution. You also get some wacky things out there. The ammonia car, you can burn anhydrous ammonia, burns to make nitrogen plus water. So there's some people out there will tell you it make a wonderful uh, car. So here's the a really brave picture which we made. It was so brave you can only publish it in a journal like Nature Geoscience uh, where they don't really want to see the details but they like the graph. And the graph is this bold line, which is the world population going up. 
And so we estimated with some bravery what might the world population have done if we didn't have that fertilizer to feed people. So we're estimating with the same food choices as now, uh, about 48% of the world is alive today because of these nitrogen fertilizers. And uh, so we've got three and a half billion people from nitrogen fertilizers alive. Um, and equally, that nitrogen, I mentioned explosives, TNT, nitroglycerin, they're all nitrogen compounds. Um, about 100 million war deaths, more or less everything apart from the nuclear bombs. So nitrogen, you really need to watch out for nitrogen. Okay, um, just to give you a bit of history, and this is relevant because I hear this is the Hutton Club, and you need to know something about James Hutton um, briefly. But before H um, Hutton, to mention uh, Rutherford, Daniel Rutherford discovered nitrogen in his MD thesis in Edinburgh University, um, 1772, called it mephitic air because he put a rat in it and the rat died. Poor rat. Um, but there was, there was no oxygen. Um, and a few more things, then Joseph Priestley discovered ammonia, and a few more things down the line, they show it contains nitrogen, somebody called it ammonia, Berthelot worked out the composition. So this is rapid learning understanding. So people think about the discovery of nitrogen compounds as being the late 18th century, more or less this decade, all rapidly happening. The interesting thing, of course, with the godfather is that you don't see it always, and that doesn't mean that it wasn't there if you didn't see it. So where might it have been if you look a bit harder? And here's one come to James Hutton now. So James Hutton established the world's first nitrogen manufacturing plant. Yes, in Edinburgh, yes. Um, he did it, and he had secrecy over the process. Even uh, James Black, didn't, who was a friend of his, didn't know the recipe he was using. Um, because, of course, it's a, a business secret. What was he doing? He was buying all the soot of Edinburgh chimneys. Uh, they took all the soot from the tr Tron men, and they were getting a yield of uh, 20, 26 kilograms of soot would give you 6 kilograms of ammonium chloride, sal ammoniac. What they did, they, I think they added salt to it actually to increase the yield because they heated it up in big glass vessels using the Egyptian method, which funnily enough was secret and used several centuries before, um, heated it all up until you volatilize the ammonium chloride and if you add salt, some more of the ammonium sulfate will go again to the ammonium chloride. Um, and then they collect the ammonium chloride up the top, sell it, use it in metallurgy, lots of other things. So here we are, and this is just a picture of Edinburgh on a typical day. To go back further, so we find out that nitrogen was being traded on the Silk Road 1,400 years ago. Apparently we discovered this stuff in the 18th century, yet, of course, there were others who knew it already. So here's a nice picture of somewhere in Tajikistan, um, and you've got coal again. The coal is in deposits near the surface. It's a really hot climate, so the coal just starts burning. And you ever have these everlasting burning coal caves. They just burn and burn and burn. And as they burn and burn and burn, you get white crystals coming out the top, which people started collecting and selling on the Silk Road at great prices. And these are roughly the places where you see it's happening, a gold dot is where they were selling this stuff. So this was happening in 600 AD. And for the uh, Chinese in the audience, I hope you know this word, and I'll apologize for my pronunciation of Nao Sha, um, uh, which uh, was already known in the Tang Dynasty. Now this gets really obscure, but you'll be very happy it becomes less obscure again shortly. This is the end of the obscurity. Um, somebody dug up these shoes, paper shoes, and they were made of recycled paper. They were made of recycled paper from tax records, telling you all the prices for selling the nitrogen compounds, the ammonium chloride. And out of that, uh, you get what were the price for this stuff. Um, so selling it in Central Asia, price of spice, price of new shadra, which is the nitrogen compound, is about the same price as, as, as spice. Um, Hang on, get that right. And uh, interesting enough, similar price in Egypt several hundred years uh, later. And uh, I've converted this to an interesting unit um, because both data sets, I'm sorry this is not sexist, both data sets contain the price of a female slave. And uh, that's, if you convert that to N, this is about five, six uh, kilograms of nitrogen buys you a human being in the sixth century. Central Asia, and the price was pretty similar 400 years later. So nitrogen is like this amazing tracer uh, going through society. And lastly, just to really annoy you, um, I'm going to tell you that Nushadra was originally not a Chinese word, but a Sogdian word, um, and it means immortal fire. 
Now, but there's a whole other lecture as to why it would be called Immortal Fire. And since this is about godfathers and secrets, I won't tell you the answer to why that is, unless you really buy me a good drink. Um, but there's plenty of people who've been murdered over trying to get the answer to that question. So nitrogen is this really amazing stuff. It's crossing society in ways people never even dreamt of. And it's crossing the planet. Because having made all that fertilizer nitrogen, emitted up into the atmosphere, um, as ammonia and NOx and all the other forms. Here's a picture of the pattern of deposition coming back down again. You see huge hot spots. Human production's gone up from 15, um, this is million tons, up to nearly 200 million tons. So, as I say, the greatest geoengineering experiment ever made. We wanted to make food, that was our need. We made this artificial fertilizer, we end up changing our planet. And this is just the sources, the Harbour Bosch nitrogen, the chemical fertilizer, biological nitrogen fixation and the nitrogen oxide emissions from combustion sources. So what have we been doing? We've, as a group of scientists, started to come together to try to talk about the whole nitrogen cycle. In the past, I and I think several other colleagues, we would each just work on our own bit and never talk to each other. And the big change for us was to start trying to pull parts of the puzzle together and also try to learn to communicate why anybody should care. Um, and so we try to do our best to get out there in the press and launch this thing called the European Nitrogen Assessment. <clears throat> so the first thing to do is to start getting your head around going from the nitrogen cycle to the nitrogen cascade. Everybody learns the nitrogen cycle at school, but it's very much a sort of story about what's meant to happen rather than what's not meant to happen. This is a story about what's not meant to happen um, because it emphasizes the losses. So we take N2, put lots of energy in, and get it into reactive nitrogen forms. And then those reactive nitrogen forms are gradually dissipating energy until it's ultimately denitrified back to N2. On the way, you're getting all these different forms, the nitrous oxide, the NOx, ammonia, those two reacting, forming particulate matter and coming out in rain. Comes back down to ecosystems, the ecosystems saturate, and then they emit even more. And the system goes on and on until it's ultimately denitrified. So this is my simple version of the diagram. You can imagine a complicated one, um, but it emphasizes all these different linkages uh, between nitrogen compounds and the challenge we face to get our head around it. And there's just a few, a, a few identifications of the impacts. Now, as a community, we started with 21 reasons to care about nitrogen. And then we realized that we can't communicate 21 reasons. So we worked hard and we got it down to nine. Here's nine. And then we worked harder again. We ultimately got it down to five reasons to care about nitrogen, which I'll show in a minute. Um, the other thing we found out, of course, we made lots of maps. It's great to have the maps. And here we are. That's NOx, ammonia, N2O, nitrate leaching. The interesting thing about these maps is a huge amount of work went into this. And individual countries care a lot, but scientifically, Strangely enough, they don't take as much. These have had much less impact um, than this. This is the one that's had huge impact, amazing enough, and there's not an equation on it. Um, it's how to simplify the nitrogen cycle for non-scientists. And the United Nations Environment Programme are using this a lot. Uh, so we said the wages of too much nitrogen, water, air quality, greenhouse gas, ecosystem, soils. So five good reasons to care about nitrogen, apart from the fact that it produces food to feed us, uh, going out into the environment. If you look hard at this diagram, by the way, you can see there's a bit more esoteric stuff in there because there's always another esoteric line and the whole thing about esoteric secrets is there's another secret behind that you haven't been told. So if they tell you one, know that there's three more they haven't told you. Um, here's uh, fi greenhouses, fire, water, air, earth and the quintessence in the middle going back to ancient Greek philosophy. So why care about nitrogen? Here's just a few impacts, the air pollution, the water pollution. Uh, this, I really like this picture. This was taken at the Beijing Olympics. And uh, they were trying to have sailing events here and had to do quite a lot of work to clear the water away to allow the sailing events to happen afterwards. Um, and of course, you've got issues where ultimately algae builds up and then it dies, it crashes, and as it decomposes, it consumes all the oxygen from the water. In consuming all the oxygen, fish can't live anymore, you get fish deaths. It's not just nitrogen, it's also phosphorus, and that's important to say. Um, but I think the key thing is that why is nitrogen of special interest? Because it's crossing between air, land, water, climate, etc. Its range of impacts is much wider. So we mentioned about greenhouse gas balance. Again, the things were a bit more complicated. Nitrogen's having warming aspects 
and cooling aspects. So warming, we're producing the nitrous oxide. We're also having an impact on tropospheric ozone. Um, on the other hand, nitrogen deposition comes back down on a forest, makes the forest grow more, makes the forest take more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and the if particulate matter also leading to light scattering, cloud condensation, nuclei, um, having a cooling effect. So you can ask a bit, is it net warming or net cooling? Well, the answer is it's both on different timescales. The big problem is that this one is the one with the longest timescale, the longest commitment period. Um, and some have said, let's have more nitrogen deposition to get the cooling effect. But the problem with that is that you then have biodiversity impacts. The same with your um, nitrogen effect on particulate matter. Uh, have cooling effect, but then you've got human health effects for air pollution and so on. You've got these trade-offs going on. <coughs> the other thing about um, the nitrogen cycle is really dependent on the climate. So um, ammonia is one of these, that's my particular favourite. Uh, it's volatile, so the warm it up and you get more emissions. And so we've done various studies on penguins and seabirds around the world um, and this is the percentage of volatilized, percentage of the excreta that ends up in the air as ammonia. And you can see it's going from 2 or 3% down here up to 40 to 50%. And um, so uh, really sensitive. And basically, if we look then at the world and say, what's the percentage volatilization occurring in different parts of the world? You can see really big numbers. These are up to 50 or 100% in the, in the warmest areas, and then numbers down to 0 to 5 in the cool, coolest areas. Put that through a climate change scenario and we've got a substantial estimated change where interestingly we get a trade-off between parts of the world which become warmer where the emissions really get bigger so here we are up in the center um, and a few negative numbers where actually it gets wetter and the wetter uh, is preventing the emission so it's a really not only impacting climate but impacted by climate <coughs> on to the air pollution issue um, and uh, the reason to show this slide is really about the visibility. So you can see in the nice crisp tree in the foreground, but in the background the town is rather hazy. And that haze is uh, um, the particulate matter, especially ammonium nitrate. Um, interestingly, who knows what the major source of particulate matter air pollution is in Europe? It, sorry, in Edinburgh. Major source of particulate matter air pollution in Edinburgh. It's, I've gone to show the slide too early, I see it came up too quick. Um, but here we are, A is agriculture. I think I was in the Scottish Parliament the other day and it was all talk about transport, transport, transport. And of course transport is giving nitrogen oxides, again another form of nitrogen. That's local, it's dispersed away from the street canyons. But with the particulate matter pollution, an awful lot is advecting in um, from another country, from the rest of the country, commuting zone, and of course no agriculture in the city. So we've got uh, these nitrogen compounds having all sorts of effects. <coughs> Mentioning the Scottish Parliament, we sit there having that conversation, really they are only concerned, as far as I can see, the politicians about human health. That's entirely the big driver of air pollution control. What they're not cared about is the ecosystems, which is Taft-like for the ecosystems. You can answer whether that's right or wrong. But just to show what happens to ecosystems if you're downwind of a strong nitrogen source. This is a peat bog in Northern Ireland, and just behind these trees was a farm. There's a chicken farm volatilizing up ammonia. The ammonia blows across and dilutes as it goes away, um, and has these big impacts. So on the left is a tree trunk of what you should be seeing, all covered with lichens and bryophytes. On the right, is the tree trunks that you actually see on this site, just covered with thick, gloopy slime. Um, so massive loss of the diversity there. Um, and also the peatland system. Peatland, of course, is important for storing carbon. This is a sphagnum moss, uh, nice and happy and healthy. Um, and uh, too much uh, nitrogen coming down, especially in the form of ammonia, it gets encroached again by the algae and eventually these things die off. This is actually one under recovery, in fact, but you get the point. Um, the system is not particularly happy with this extra nitrogen. <coughs> so let's go back to the big picture. And the big picture we faced was the European scale. And for the first time, we tried to bring together this big picture of the budget of overall flows in and out of Europe. And that proved really useful because it tells us where we might want to act. Um, and the uh, flow is here, this is natural, um, blue is agriculture, 
and the yellow is everything unintended, all the losses. So you can see there's lots of losses. But every one of those numbers is a place then for taking action. Um, so this is changing your fossil fuel use and cleaning technology, um, crop production, improving efficiency, livestock farming, manure management, wastewater treatment. The one that struck me is really important, really interesting, is this one up here, um, number seven, which is our food choice. And you learn a really interesting thing from this diagram because we're growing all these crops as nitrogen. These are in millions of tons, by the way, um, to grow all the livestock. Um, but we're only actually taking that much food off the livestock and that much food off the crops. Or put it another way, people will tell you that the fertilizer is, is for food security. Actually, this tells you it's for feed security in Europe. So 85% of the harvested nitrogen is going to feed livestock. Only 15% is going to feed people. We're eating more meat than we need for a healthy diet. Um, therefore, this choice of the proportion of, of plant and animal-based foods becomes critical to uh, improving the performance of this system. <clears throat> so what are the actions, just to run through them? There's three with agriculture, um, transport and industry, uh, wastewater recycling, and a big focus on recycling rather than denitrification. If you think about a wastewater plant going to denitrification, that's a massive waste of resource. Um, and societal consumption patterns, both energy and transport, and our food choices. <coughs> we took all our results of our European nitrogen assessment and offered them to nature as good scientists. So we gave them some really exciting graphs, lovely mechanisms, lovely processes, and they said that's all very boring. That's sad, isn't it? Anyway, but what they did like, because it's nature and a journal focused on the natural environment, is they liked their money, economics. Um, and so this graph was in the end published in Nature, and this shows the estimated damage costs of nitrogen pollution in Europe. So 70 to 320 billion euro a year worth of damage cost. So it's these difficult numbers to make. This is willingness to pay. So you've got to value your ecosystems, value your human health, value your climate. It's tough and it gives you wide error bars sometimes because you can't quite figure out how to value it. I think the interesting thing from this graph is that firstly it tells you these two bars you should really take notice of, the ammonia and the NOx to air. So it's the human health impacts on air pollution which are the biggest costs. So think especially about the air pollution challenge. Um, the other thing was it tells you that the climate costs, relatively speaking, are rather small. Either that or are undervaluing our willingness to pay for climate. <coughs> But that's only one way of doing it. That was the hard way of doing it. We presented that in Geneva and various places. Uh, the press was interested, the media was interested, but the policymakers basically said, we don't care even about those numbers. Or put it another way, when I put it to one policymaker, Mark will just find another reason to not take action. Because their primary thing was not taking action. Um, now these make much easier numbers, and, but actually end up having a, a stronger traction. I valued the nitrogen losses from Europe and multiplied it by a fertilizer price. So this is real money, real resource, what you would pay for a fertilizer bag, but it's nitrogen pollution. So effectively, this is saying we've got 18 billion euro a year worth of lost resource worth real money. And what does that mean? Um, that's 25% of Europe's common agricultural policy budget. So if you took a typical debate on common agricultural policy and asked what percentage of the time in common agricultural policy debates was reserved to nitrogen, I think you'd get less than 0.01%. Um, but if you look at the value of that resource which is lost through nitrogen pollution, you get a quarter of it. So this has actually become a much stronger driver um, and it gets you thinking about circular economy models about how you would take action and recover some of those uh, things. <clears throat> now, what are these actions that you would take? So I'm coming from the ammonia world, but it goes wider, of course, than ammonia. Um, and this is stuff we've done for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. The top measures. Measure number one, when you spread your manure, don't just fling it everywhere. Get it in the soil, nice and neat, nice neat rows, preferably in the soil, not on it. And do it in such a way that the value of the fertilizer you save is actually going to pay for itself. Then uh, better feeding strategies, optimise the diets of the animals, put lids on your manure piles, um, do a farm nitrogen balance to figure out where all your sources are, and finally at the end, have cleaner housing systems. 
those are last because they're more expensive. So here's just a few pictures. I say this current technology we're using is 1950s technology. Um, we're still using it. It flings it out in all sorts of a mess, not very even, maximizing the surface area and the emission to the atmosphere. But all these methods are available and have already been used. In fact, in the Netherlands, they were the first country, they made this one mandatory in 19, I think, 97, 1993. So th there's people who have been doing this for years. And, the, and it raises a really interesting question about, I call it the car and the exhaust pipe. You wouldn't drive your car without an exhaust pipe. You wouldn't drive your car without a catalytic converter if it's a petrol one nowadays. And yet, in agriculture, it's socially acceptable not to use the best available technology. <coughs> um, in fertilizers, there's opportunities there as well. Um, these are slides uh, taken from India where we're working with Indian partners testing performance of lemus, which is a proprietary product, to uh, reduce the rate that urea breaks down to liberate ammonia. If you slow the rate down, it gives the plants a bigger chance to take it up and grow better. And these are showing uh, big results. In fact, Germany has made a law this year saying that all of their fertilizer, when you use urea in Germany, as of this year, you have to use low emission techniques like this for fertilizer application. So we've been involved in this thing called the Task Force on Reactive Nitrogen. We've done a whole load of guidance documents. Um, we've prepared options for a vision of protocols. We've fed into the revision of the National Emission Ceilings Directive. There's the dunger for Ordnung on the fertilizer in Germany. Um, we've made this framework code. The interesting thing I get about all this, which is not producing scientific papers, by the way, <laughs> but hopefully it's vaguely useful, and we learn from it, is this massive unwillingness of countries to take action because they've seen nitrogen just as a pollution. And that's why I think this discussion of about it as a resource is critical. And to get that full benefit of the resource, we have to think of all the nitrogen flows, not see air pollution or water pollution alone, but see it all together. <clears throat> just to show you a bit about the embarrassment, this is 20, 2000 to 2020, how SO2 emissions are coming down. That's SO2, that's the NOx, that's the PM2.5, there's the VOCs, this is the nitrogen coming from agriculture, the ammonia. So it's really, uh, there, I, I was amazed when one particular country in Geneva stuck up its flag and offered its reductions, 55% for sulfur dioxide, 40% um, for NOx, 1% for ammonia. And many of the countries actually offered a 1%, uh, basically saying they're committing to nearly nothing. <coughs> So this circular economy view, I think, is the way forward for us to bring nitrogen out in the open, make it better known. And it's going to be better known, I think, if we can mobilize markets, just like the carbon story has mobilized markets. So think about all that resource going out. Let's have markets that recapture the NOx in manure. So one of the things that's starting to happen is that in areas where they've got too much manure, they, have to, they can't put it on the land. So they get someone to take it away. The guy digests that, gets the gas off, the methane, and then takes the rich liquor, the fertilizer digest, and um, takes ammonia off and sells it back to the fertilizer company to make ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate. Uh, this is another one. This, this line didn't exist, actually, until we drew this diagram. Uh, you make your NOx uh, from combustion and energy sources, but actually none of it is recycled. In principle, uh, you could wash out um, nitrate out of your large combustion plant, stick it in a bag and sell it. Now, we're a million miles away from making that economic, but that could lead to a change of thinking, enabling ultimately to go further than one would have gone in the past. <coughs> and uh, put this in a green economy terms again, um, if we try to add up our net benefit, it is what would happen if we improved efficiency of the world's nitrogen cycle by 20%, saving $23 a billion a year worth of fertilizer, perhaps costing us around 12 and the even bigger environmental health benefits. You don't need to worry about the exact values, uh, but our contention is that there's money to be saved and that whatever you value it, the societal costs are the really big ones. <coughs> so let's finish with making it really personal because um, manure management, I think, is probably not something we can all engage with directly. But every time we drink or eat, uh, we engage. So we, we did this report, Nitrogen on the Table. What would happen if we leave agricultural practices exactly as they are, but choose to eat food differently? And the big point was that we're eating more meat and dairy than we need for a healthy diet. And um, we got a nice reaction in the Times. 
Um, well, I say nice reaction. It was rather rather cautious. Uh, raise, they picked on the raised taxes message. You have to look deep in the report to find that. Um, we did say demeterian. Demeterian means half meat consumption. We're not quite the UN, uh, but uh, we were working for them. <clears throat> so what were the messages? Halving meat and dairy intake would reduce your pollution levels by 40%. And secondly, you would double the efficiency of the food system in Europe from around 22 to 44%. So this is a massive change without even taking a single technical measure. And interestingly enough, the times warmed up a bit later. Uh, they went from a cautious welcome to a year later actually putting it in their leader article and then saying how much less 40% less. So they've not met our 50% target yet, but uh, um, at least that discussion is moving forward. So here are the numbers, just putting them in detail, um, between a reference and a normal scenario. Take first, for example, this uh, intake of red meat as an indicator. According to the World Cancer Research Programme, we're eating twice the amount of red meat needed for a healthy diet. So our scenario takes us from 207% down to 107%. <coughs> um, we then find out that because so much land is used for livestock, if you've got less livestock, you don't know what to do with your land. Um, so we had to make two scenarios, a high prices scenario that says all that free land we'll use for growing crops for export, or a greening scenario we said we'd use it for bioenergy. And here are the various numbers, you can see them coming down, less ammonia, less N2O, less nitrate leaching, less GHG emissions, doubling the e efficiency of the system, less imports of soybean, more exports and additional production of bioenergy. The list goes on and on. So this is an incredibly uh, powerful driver, um, meaning that basically every time we eat a high resource efficiency piece of food, we should ask ourselves, how efficient is it? The other thing is it's helped us an awful lot in communicating to the wider world. I don't think we would ever have had this if we were only talking about manure management. Um, so I'm very pleased that etymology, as runners, you can buy it and have it in your Christmas stocking for Christmas. I get no royalties. I'm sorry about that. Um, but what's in etymology? The Dictionary of Modern Gastronomy. gastronomy. Somewhere after crop swap and before drunkorexia, and drunkorexia, by the way, is where you stop eating food so that you can get all of your calories from alcohol. <laughs> there is Demeterian. Demeterian has made it into popular parlance in this book, and it tells us its product placement. It tells us about the Barsac Declaration, the commitment we made for our conferences to reduce meat consumption. It tells us about our report, Nitrogen on the Table. So, and that's the length of text you get. Nothing much at all, but you're starting having a conversation with the world about nitrogen. So, that's where we're going. Um, we're looking now to the future and the global scale. We're working with the United Nations Environment Programme to say what might be happening to nitrogen cycle in the world and what might we do about it. Um, there's a few graphs here just of where nitrogen was in 62 and 2006. And that's what's projected for 2050. So, in particular, Latin America, Southeast Asia, South Asia are doubling of fertilizer. And that probably means a more than doubling of pollution. Let's see. We need to look into those. So, we are working on something which, imagine something like the IPCC for nitrogen, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is called the International Nitrogen Management System, working with the United Nations Environment Programme and funding from lots of others. Um, Here's just you get a flavour of the main blocks of what this is looking at. Tools, demonstration, the global assessment, awareness raising, uh, engaging with policy makers and practitioners to raise this conversation about where is nitrogen going in the world in the future. Um, we're facing, I think, a really big challenge because nitrogen policies currently are fragmented. Here's item S with relevance for all of these. You'll know the Montreal Protocol for stratospheric ozone. The Convention on Biological Diversity, you'll know. Uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This one's a hard one. Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution Convention. And the last one is even worse, the Global Programme of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment from Land-Based Activities. So, nitrogen's relevant to all of these, and how many of them talk to each other? Well, not very well, is the answer. And so we're having this discussion about how to mobilise what we're calling the policy arena. I'm going to be in the United Nations Environment Assembly next week doing our bit to try to raise the profile and get these organisations talking to each other um, and of course feeding back 
to allowing us to give a more detailed understanding and, and clearer basis for actions. <coughs> so let's finish and just remind why we should care about nitrogen. I particularly put it in a policy context because this is not the decade for big action. It's usually, I'd say, probably the decade for rigging out of action. Um, so it's a period of little commitment. So we have to be really creative. Nobody wants a new policy process. Nobody wants to commit to too much. Um, so let's think of all the reasons. There's the wages, the, the, the water, air, greenhouse, ecosystem, soils. Several reasons for caring about nitrogen. Offering win-wins between environment and food security. We're not just talking about a negative message of reduced pollution, but a positive message of improving efficiency, which can of course feed into circular economy development. And we think, but by putting all those together, that will help address the barriers to change. So with that, I finish and open it for questions. <laughs>